I'm going to um, introduce the sort of general subject of how plants and microbes interact with each other. And um, if I just summarise what I'm going to talk about, there's two main things. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about how uh, the mechanism by which um, microbes actually attach to roots, how they colonise roots, and I'm going to use rhizobium and legumes as an example of that. And then I'm going to move rather more generally out into how plants change the total microbial community. So how the entire uh, interaction between a plant and the complex array of microorganisms um, can influence that microbial community. So from the single to the general, which is sort of a focus of a lot of our work. So just for those of you, uh, maybe in an audience like this, many of you will know about the importance of soil, but I always like to put this up in any uh, plant um, symposium, just to remind people that about microorganisms are the, the organisms responsible for cycling nutrients in soil. And I like to tell them this thing, I think, looks like it's just about had the battery. Um, I can just about see it there. That there's a huge number of microbial cells in soil, something like 10 to the 9 cells um, per gram of soil. And ah, that looks like. Can I see that one? Oh, it doesn't look much different, but it's right, it's green, so that, that'll be okay. Um, but what I think is important to realise is that plants actually secrete large amounts of carbohydrate and organic acids into soil, which is you know, as much as 20% of the photosynthate. That's perhaps the upper estimate, but even the lower estimates of 5 to 10% show that the plants have a huge investment in the carbon and nitrogen that they put into soil. And just for the Arabidopsis people, it's always useful to remind them that if you take a Arabidopsis and you put it into gamma irradiated soil, it usually doesn't grow. It actually needs microbes to be changing nutrient status, making uh, nutrients soluble for Arabidopsis to be able to grow, which is why you put it on uh, M&S medium and put sucrose in there and all sorts of things that you'll often do in the laboratory. I know, that, I know what you do, don't worry. OK, so I said the first theme I really wanted to cover was the mechanism of rhizosphere colonisation by microbes. So it was really how could we start to understand from the particular example of rhizobium how a microbe is able to colonise a root and what factors are involved in that. So the first thing we did some years ago, and I always like to put this up as a reminder of the overall picture, was to take three different plants. Our favourite one, which is pea, which is the legume we mostly work with, and which is actually the host plant for our uh, main microorganism we work with, which is Rhizobium leguminosarum bioviviciate. So this microbe actually nodulates P. And that's a very special thing if you work in plant-microbe interactions because you know that this microbe associates with this plant, and usually that's not the case. So we know there must be very specific adaptations of Rhizobium to P as well as the general adaptations a microbe has to have to the uh, root environment. So to try and tease that information apart, we also put rhizobium into the rhizosphere of alfalfa, so another legume, but not a host legume, one that it can't modulate. And finally, we put it onto sugar beet. In fact, actually now I probably would put it onto wheat or something like that, or onto cereal. We've done that subsequently, but at the time we chose sugar beet. And what we wanted to do was just compare the transcriptome of the microorganisms in those three different rhizospheres. Now, I don't want to bore you too much with loads of detail, but I put up this diagram, which was actually a lot of work, because what it was doing was taking the microarray data and then actually mapping it back to transcriptional patterns we'd established for different transport systems. So we could actually then map in black are the transport systems which are elevated in the rhizosphere of all plants. The ones in green are those that are just uh, upregulated in P. So, for example, you could see that in the rhizosphere of P, the microorganisms were encountering, encountering tartrate. Uh, they were encountering changes in magnesium levels. Um, but if you looked at in the alfalfa rhizosphere, they were seeing a lot of melanate. And in all rhizospheres, they were seeing a lot of organic, a lot of aromatics, I should say, like protocatechate and shikimate. So the important thing was, was establishing the chemical environment actually in the root system that the plants were encountering and that it differed between different plants. If you take root exudates of plants and chemically analyse them, 
you get a completely different picture of what's there. In fact, the microorganisms are almost certainly changing the type of secretion we're seeing. But it was dominated by a lot of organic acids. So we can do that. We can also do it for metabolism, uh, the metabolic pathways. Uh, the only thing I would point out is essentially our organisms had switched on gluconeogenesis. And our rhizobium leguminosarum only does that when it's growing on organic acids. So in the root environment, they're not growing on sugars. The plants are not releasing a lot of sugars. They're actually releasing mostly organic acids. And in particular, we always saw a huge signal for the phenylalanine catabolic pathway. And this has been a recurrent theme we've seen from other groups as well on leaves. You always see phenylalanine coming out. And we could also show that around about a third of the genes which are switched on in the rhizosphere in our bacteria are induced in a, in, a, in a laboratory culture if you add phenylalanine. And it really looked like phenylalanine was something like a signal of the presence of the rhizosphere. You know, essentially, since there's so much phenylalanine required in generation of lignin, we believe that you, plants can't avoid but release at least some phenylalanine. And it becomes almost a signal for the presence of a plant root. <coughs> But I really didn't want to bother you too much with a metabolic analysis of what's coming out of roots. There's been lots and lots of studies using GCMS and so forth. What we really wanted to do was use that information to then try and establish the patterns and the genetic regulation of how microbes attach to roots. Now what we felt was going to be crucial in this was to be able to do spatial and temporal mapping of where genes were being switched on. And we made a lot of different types of fusions. And if you think about it, we had lots of genes that we knew that were switched on in the rhizosphere. I showed you metabolic genes, but there were lots of regulatory genes, lots of cell membrane dependent proteins that are being induced in the rhizosphere. But we felt to make any sense of that, we needed to know exactly where and when on roots these genes were being switched on. In practice, that's turned out to be really, really difficult to do. We made GFP fusions and GUS fusions and LAC-Z fusions to the genes. And it never really worked at a whole root level until we went back to what's now, I guess, a fairly old technology in using LUX. So these are the Vibrio fisheri um, genes which produce light. They were related in terms of what you get out of the, the luciferase genes, but it's a separate enzyme complex. But the bottom line is that we can we linked up a series of these promoters. And just using one very simple example, and I've chosen phenylalanine as the obvious case here. This is the phenylalanine hydroxylase gene. We take this region of DNA, the promoter region, and this is the phenylalanine regulator here. And when we take that region and we clone it in front of the LUX genes, this is the result in a, in a laboratory culture. So this is just our bacteria streaked out in phenylalanine. And you can see we get a very, very strong, very specific signal in response to phenylalanine. And we did that, and we just took that to a whole series of different key compounds which we found in the, um, being secreted in our microarrays. And, and this is just the list of the main things we have ended up using. I think you'll probably look at them and you can see a few key things like sucrose, salicylate, phenylalanine, of course, and the uh, C4 dicarboxylates like malate and uh, malonate. So then we had very specific fusions to these compounds which only switch on when our microorganisms see these particular um, compounds. And this is just an early example of a few of these fusions in action on roots. Once we started to map these properly, this just shows you a pea plant and uh, it's, it's sort of like bonsai um, growth of pea plants. These are square petri dishes, they're 13 centimetres. We actually cut a little hole in the lid and we let the, we let the uh, shoot go free so it can actually uh, grow in the light. Uh, we keep the roots in the dark, and this is growing on agar. And then we inoculate them with fusions. And if you look at this top one for phenylalanine, you can see colonization and expression of these genes over the root system. So this is just showing us where phenylalanine is being secreted, and both at four days and then at 18 days. We actually do these over a whole series of different time points because we can re-image them because it's non-destructive. But we've just chosen two crucial time points. Here you'll notice it's very punctate. Actually, these are nodules. So we're seeing phenylalanine being secreted by the roots very early and also being released uh, or actually secreted inside the nodules that are forming on the plant. If we look at something like sucrose, we see almost very, very little sucrose at four days, 
very, very strong sucrose in the root nodules. The plant obviously is, as we know, is redirecting carbon from the shoot down to the nodules to power nitrogen fixation. You can compare that to something like malinate, massive secretion very early on over the entire root system, but absolutely nothing in older roots. And the very absence of, you can't see the nodules easily here, but that's also because they're not being lit up. There's no malinate in nodules. Uh, if we look at succinate, we get a little bit here, but massive production of succinate in nodules because actually the plant provides sucrose down to the nodules. The, the cytosolic cells in the nodule then convert the sucrose into malate, and that's fed to bacteroids. And this is an example of a, a compound, gamma minute butyric acid, which we only ever see secreted in fairly late nodules. Uh, if we take pictures of early nodules, there's nothing. It's only in the later nodules this is really building up. So we could build up this chemical picture of what was happening in nodules. And of course, we do the same sort of thing with nitrogen fixation genes. These are the NIF genes being switched on at 16 and 22 days, or the fixation genes. Uh, and of course, we use this for a lot of mechanistic studies of what's happening in nitrogen fixation. And I've just cherry-picked a couple of simple genes there. OK, just, I've just thrown this slide in from a student gave this to me last week. If you work on fungi, one of the things we've noticed all along is if we get fungi anywhere near our bacterial fusions, we get them glowing like crazy. And in fact, this is just to show that actually this is really specific. This is Magnaportha here, uh, and this is no Magnaportha here. And we can show that salicylate is being lit up. So the Magnaportha are clearly releasing a lot of salicylate that does not light up in the minus uh, fungal control. Uh, and also we get a lot of phenylalanine being released, which also does not light up in the minus fungal control. So it's also a lovely way to look at the secretion of compounds by fungi. And we're doing a lot of experiments now where we, we take a plant, we inoculate the shoot, and we're now looking for what happens to secretion by the roots once the plant's been inoculated with the fungus. So looking for changes in what happens in these tripartite interactions. OK, but I just wanted to focus then. We've been looking at what, what's happening chemically out in the rhizosphere. What's the plant secreting? And now we've got this amazing system where we can spatially map secretion of compounds. But what about the actual steps controlling attachment? Now, we're interested particularly a lot of the time in what's going on down here in nitrogen fixation. But in terms of the plant microbiome and the plant community, the first key steps are attachment to roots. And in terms of rhizobium, this idea of a chemical signal coming from the plant, a flavonoid, inducing the nod genes, and as you heard Giles Aldroyd talk about yesterday, then secretion of lipokytooligosaccharides by the rhizobium, which are perceived by the plant to induce nodule formation. But really, it all begins here with attachment. And the, the paradigm is the first thing that the bacteria do is they attach to root hairs. But what is the mechanism by which this occurs? So if you like, attachment to the root. So in those mi early microarrays, we found three genes in a little operon that were massively upregulated. The first of them looks like a lipoprotein. The second is an extracytoplasmic sigma factor. So now we're into a regulatory system. And the third was an anti-sigma factor. And traditionally, the way these things work, the anti-sigma factor sits in the membrane and binds the sigma factor and stops it activating genes. When a signal comes in from the environment, usually you get cleavage of the anti-sigma factor, release of the sigma factor, and then transcription of a whole bunch of genes. And just to sort of point out there that these three genes were like, you know, the, the LPPE, the first gene of the operon, was 118-fold upregulated in the P rhizosphere and 30-fold in the alfalfa and sugar beet rhizosphere, and the other genes were also up. So that's what suggested to us in the first place this might be interesting. And also, here's our old friend again, we could at least get a partial induction of this by phenylalanine in the environment. So we started to have a suggested ligand um, which would actually induce this system. Now this is just to show uh, what we did here was simply looked at the ability of the bacteria to attach to the, uh, um, the root in little seedlings at uh, five days old. And really all the point is here is that when you make the anti-sigma factor mutant, the system gets switched on crazily. So basically this is showing us this is a negative regulator. When we knock it out, the operon gets really upregulated, 
And you can see, if you compare the wild type to the mutant, this is a log scale. We have a massive increase in attachment of the bacteria. What it also showed us that we weren't expecting, but that the LPP E protein is also acting as a negative regulator. So actually these two things are, are getting together to inactivate the sigma factor. When you knock either of them out, the sigma factor switches up the whole operon and we get massive attachment. So clearly we had a really nice operon which seemed to be important in attachment. However, we do another thing is when we actually measure the colonization. And what we do here is we actually take the, the, the bacteria and we allow them not just to stick onto the roots, but to colonize the roots over a week. So they have seven days to spread over the root system. If you like, colonize, not just do the initial sticking. And what we found is you get exactly the opposite. Uh, first of all, this is our wild type. If you take the ECFE knockout mutant, it is a major reduction in the ability to colonize. So that suggested, yeah, it's important for colonization. But to our real surprise, the worst colonizing strain was the anti-sigma factor mutant. So this is, the, this is the strain which sticks to the root like a limpet. But if you stick to the root like a limpet, you're absolutely terrible at colonizing. And the bottom line here, and I think this is a really important message in the way microbes actually colonize plant roots, is you have to stick to the root in the first place, but you've got to let go. If you stick too tightly, you can't undergo this dynamic sticking and then migrating over the root and colonizing it. You actually get stuck and you can't colonize very well. So you do not want to overexpress this operon. You need to express it in a very timely fashion. Okay, that's all very grand talk. So then, of course, but we've now got our Lux mapping system. And if you look at what happens here, this is the most spatially resolved gene expression we've ever seen of a microbe on a root. It is absolutely remarkable. If you look at two days, I think you can see this very, very specific induction just on the tips of roots. And this is the same plant at seven days. You can see the same thing as the roots growing. And this beautiful image at 16 days, where again you can see it's just on the emerging tip of the root that we can actually see these genes being expressed. And if we actually zoom in on this, this is just a higher power magnification just of the root tips, and this is just increasing the gain, and this is a higher resolution image, you can see that this is the region where we're getting all our gene expression. It's just here on the elongation zone of the root. And if we switch now to confocal, uh, where we use of course, GFP is, and, and Cherry are wonderful fusions when you want to get much higher resolution. The importance of Lux is it allows us to map the whole root system to know where we should be looking and to be able to do the mapping in real time. This is a constitutive fusion. We, we, we have a little plasmid that constitutively marks our bacteria so we can always see where they are. And this is our inducible fusion on our LPPE, which is Cherry, and of course the overlay <laughs> is perfect, um, a perfect overlay. The important thing is we were surprised. We were expecting things to be stuck onto root hairs. They're not. They're clearly attaching right onto the surface of the root. Uh, and this is occurring very, very early. And in fact, if we go to a much later image, this is, root, this is a root hair. Same thing, constitutive fusion, cherry for LPPE. But actually, there's virtually nothing other than background, and the overlay is almost entirely green. This is occurring further up the root. So at the very tip of the root, we're getting this very initial attachment. And then root hair attachment is occurring later, further up the root. So in fact, this is saying the initial stages of attachment are actually attaching to the very, uh, to the elongation zone, the elongating root. It's attaching there. And we think it's probably then coming off there and uh, around several days later is then able to attach uh, to root hairs. You might like to notice that the root hair attachment is end on. The bacteria actually stick onto roots by a polar lo located glucomannan molecule uh, in their um, in the, uh, cell surface. What's um, important to realize, we have this, this system which is very, very precisely enabling attachment to this elongation zone. But also, if we t look at when we take, um, this is an ASFE mutant, so the anti-sigma factor mutant, so where the sigma factor is now overexpressing, and if we put those cells back into the rhizosphere, we have all hell breaks loose. 
This is just a few of the top hits, a massive fold induction of a whole stack of proteins, including yet more sigma factors. So this is truly the master regulator of a whole, a whole regulon of genes which are being switched on. And if you think about what the spatial location is telling you, what's the first thing you're going to detect as the root grows down into the soil is the elongation zone. And so this is the first master regulon which is involved in enabling the bacteria to attach. And then it's switching on a whole bunch of other genes which are crucial in terms of the regulation. What's also key to understand though is if we overexpress this operon, you can imagine we actually really muck up all the subsequent steps in colonization of roots. So I'm not going to um, give you, there's a whole stack of details, I'm going to fire over anti-sigma factors and uh, so forth that we've been working on and chip seek to look at where everything's binding. But what we do know is we have our, anti, our sigma factor then, which is actually able to uh, auto-activate the operon. It's then controlling extracellular polysaccharides. It's switching on diguanolate cyclases, which in bacteria control a whole series of different aspects of attachment, and yet more uh, sigma factor systems. Um, and of course, what that's of course leading to, there is also, we found a second regulator here in adhesin, which in turn actually acts as a negative regulator of this system. You're not interested in the details. The point is that clearly as a master regulator, there is a whole series of other regulatory uh, factors feeding into uh, control of this. Now I just want to show you this very briefly um, because this, I'm going to show you some data which I got last Thursday. So it's very partial data. But we've been developing, using a technique in the lab called insertion sequencing. Um, and we've used this in free living rhizobia and it just literally knocks you off your seat because it's a microbial technique where you do saturation mutagenesis of the chromosome. So we isolate a million transposon mutants in an organism that has 7,000 genes. So we have around, you know, 1,000, 2,000 hits in every gene. And this mariner transposon inserts in TA sites, so you can actually predict exactly where it should insert. So you isolate a mutant library, and it turns out using uh, uh, high throughput sequencing, you can essentially isolate all the insertion sites of the transposon. You can map them and have the frequency. And you might say, who, ca who cares? It's absolutely revolutionary in plant microbe interactions. Because what, we've been at, what we can do in the technique is simply take our mutant library, inoculate it onto um, plants in this case, and then we can, in this case, growing them in, in a simple system like vermiculite, we then simply isolate the microbes in the rhizosphere, if you like, the vermiculite, versus the bacteria that are tightly bound to the roots. We isolate the DNA out of the bacteria, we map where the insertions are, and you think, well, so what? Just imagine you're a gene you need to attach to a root. And you've got, on average, about 30 TA sites in that gene. What happens is all of those insertions, the mutants that go into those sites, get lost because they can't attach. So when you do this, come back and do the sequencing, uh, you find that all those mutations are missing, so you know that gene is essential for attachment. And the important thing is you've got 7,000 genes, so each each mutation in each gene, that mutant has to compete against 6,999 strains which are not mutated in that gene. So it's a perfect competition experiment in a way that doesn't work if you try and do two strong competitions. And I was just going to put, put this up because I don't want to go through all the data. But from just looking at one little plasmid, not the whole chromosome, this is PRL10, which is the symbiotic plasmid in rhizobium. We found 39 genes are growth defective specifically for root attachment. And the key thing is we can compare what you need in the free living culture, what you need for growth in the rhizosphere, and what you need to latch onto a root. And one was essential for root attachment, 39 were growth defective. And I just put this up because this is a bunch of genes that my really good friend Alan Downey discovered years ago. They're the most highly expressed genes in the rhizosphere of rhizobium. Trouble is, none of us know what the hell they're doing. And the first thing that comes screaming out of this in-seq analysis is every gene in that operon, it actually causes you to lose the ability to colonize roots. You're fine for growth in the rhizosphere, absolutely crucial for being able to stick to roots. 
And what we're doing at the moment in my lab, because really we're interested in that complete continuum, is we're doing in-seek in free-living cultures, we're doing in-seek for growth in the rhizosphere, in-seek for attachment, in-seek for growth down infection threads, and in-seek in bacteroids. And you can do all of these separately. And what it allows you to build up is a simply astonishing picture because it gives you an answer for all 7,000 genes, which ones are essential, which ones affect growth rates. And in the case of E. coli, in-seek is so powerful, you can detect a two-minute change in generation time. And this, we're seeing this in rhizobium. You only have to have a small change in generation time to see that you're influencing the growth of the organism. And the important thing is, is that you can use a hidden Markov model to get statistical prediction of whether a gene is at a reduced frequency in the output pool. So it's just proving to be remarkably powerful um, to actually see the genes that are important in these interactions. So really in summary then, I'm just saying that actually if you want to stick onto a root, if you want to grow in the rhizosphere, it's actually a multi depend it's a multi, multiple steps are involved both initially growing in the rhizosphere, but particularly attaching to roots. It has to be temporally separated, that you have to stick and then you have to let go. And I'm just really wanting to point out that things like in-seq, where you get true in-situ competition assays, I think is sort of revolutionising our ability to find out what genes are important. But I would argue it's only going to make sense when you then are able to combine that with things like root mapping using LUX or equivalent techniques to actually look at the spatial and temporal separation of when genes are being switched on and off to understand um, how uh, um, attachment and how colonisation is occurring. So in the remaining time, I'd just like to talk about the overall community. Um, so we did these experiments where we, we've been working on this single bug for a long time and we wanted to actually move out and look at communities so ask the question, how would plants change communities? And as geneticists, we took a rather different approach from the environmental microbiologists that would go out and dig up plants and just see what was in the rhizosphere. We decided to take good old Arabidopsis, Metacargo truncatula, the model legium, and Brachypodium, because of course Brachypodium is used a lot here at the John Inner Centre as, as a model for cereals. And what we did was we grew them in uh, beach sand, in silver sand, basically. <coughs> But what we did was we added a 10% inoculum of soil. We just said, look, the soil here is just an inoculum. Then we'd grow them, we'd isolate the microbial community from around the roots, and we'd characterise it. Then we'd take the soil remaining in the pot and we'd stick it into another generation. 25% uh, of the soil, 25% of what remained in here was put into, into the second generation, and then 25% into the third generation. What we wanted to do was look at whether different plants would select different communities, and we wanted to look at succession in the community. What would happen as you had to grow continuously over multiple generations on Arabidopsis or Metacargo or Brachypodium? This is a classic sort of, you know, sort of, sort of experiment a, a geneticist or a physiologist would like to do. And we did all this in the lab, so it's, it's artificial. But clearly the first generation, you can see, this is multi-dimensional scaling. Each triangle simply represents the community of one plant. And you can see that we have uh, our unplanted soil, we have Brachypodium, we have Arabidopsis and Metacarga down here. So we get good separation of um, the plants. And the community, the microbial community, is very different, even though it started from the same community even in generation one. This is simply showing over three generations, triangles are generation one, squares are two, and circles are three. And in essence, what you can see is actually, it started out fairly well clustered, and it separates out, and the communities diverge even further from each other. So we get a very, very big change in the community. So we could represent as, as a ternary plot. If you haven't seen these before, this is the uh, metacargo axis. Um, so in this case, this red dot is a, a dot which is found about 90% is found only in the metacargo rhizosphere. Uh, this green dot is found 30% in the brachypodium um, uh, rhizosphere, 50% in the arabidopsis rhizosphere, and 20% in the metacargo rhizosphere. We just looked at the frequency of each bug in each of the three rhizospheres, combined it, and then said, you know, how, how much do we find it in that rhizosphere? You know, so this is, if you like, is a metacargo-specific bug. 
You might say, well, okay, why the colours? The colours is simply this, this bug, when we found it, was 90% of the time we found it in the um, Brachypodium rhizosphere. But actually, when we looked at its frequency in unplanted soil, it was much more abundant in unplanted soil. So hence, blue is actually telling us this bug, although we find it when we look in the rhizosphere of the three plants, mostly in the Brachypodium rhizosphere, it's usually much more abundant in the soil. I.e., this is a microorganism which Brachypodium can't stop getting into the rhizosphere, even though it's normally a soil organism, whereas a red organism is one which Metacargo actually actively pulls out of the rhizosphere community. It's doing something to enable it to grow specifically in its rhizosphere. And so this shows you this for the entire microbial community. It looks a bit of a mess. You can see a whole bunch of stuff in the middle here. You do occasionally see some nice red dots down here, a metacargo organism. But it is essentially a mess. But what I, I've taken the lines off here because it gets a bit messy, but each of these can be assigned to a, at least a genus of organism. I should say the actual area of the dot represents the abundance of that organism. So this is a more abundant organism here than this little blue thing down here. But the important thing is this is now the three generations. This is the same plot for, uh, that I showed you in the previous slide for the first generation. But look at the second generation. Now I know I'm red-green colorblind like a lot, of, a lot of men, okay? But I reckon, there's a real Australian expression there, I reckon you can see there that there's a lot of red there. So by the time you have the second generation, you're showing massive selection is occurring in the community. So repeated growth of plants, uh, shouldn't surprise any farmer actually, growing the same plant over multiple generations. You're pulling the community into a very, very specific community, very strong micro, uh, microbe specific. I should say the, the microbes in the middle, of course, are microbes that are growing all three rhizospheres, but a lot of things out here in the corners, of course, are specific. Um, what happened in the third generation, though, is really interesting. There was a virtual collapse, particularly in the Arabidopsis community. I essentially, Arabidopsis became overrun by this organism down here. Does that sound a little bit like a pathogen attack to you? Uh, in other words, the community was becoming highly unstable in this situation of multiple uh, passaging. And here we actually had a single type of isolate, now about 95%. Um, you can, again, find our mycelias, you can find our arthrobacters, acromobacters, and if you want to go crazy, you can join up the lines to everything. You can still find it. Um, you don't really want to get your head around that, but it just shows you that organisms are still there, but it's all about the abundance and relative abundance that's changing. Um, we actually um, could take this, uh, we did this sort of analysis with um, some crop plants as well. So this is showing pea versus, this is soil and wheat. This is an oat mutant, this is oat and an oat sad mutant. This is for the eukaryotic population and this is for the prokaryotic population. Uh, so if we just look at the prokaryotes, again you can see pea, this, this is a PCA analysis, but the microbial community in pea is way out here, the oats down here. Soil and wheat always come out very closely to, be, to each other. They're not separating very strongly. The community that we have here in the soil is already very similar to what wheat is promoting. But what was interesting was we could also do the same analysis with eukaryotes. This is our, our bacteria, but this is all our fungi, uh, nematodes, amoebae, uh, are all in this analysis. And what this actually um, told us was something that's really very simple. If we then actually looked at the proportion between bacteria and, if you, and archaea, and eukaryotes, just look at soil and wheat. Just look at the, the pale green one here. This is the eukaryotic population, it's about 3%. But as soon as we went to oat, that eukaryotic population, this is using the same soil grown in the glasshouse, went to 12% and in pea it went to 15%. So actually, there was a kingdom level change in the microbial community. And this hadn't been seen before because what most microbiologists do is they use PCR of DNA, and so they, you have to make a decision. I'm going to PCR up the microbes, or I'm going to PCR up the fungi, or I'm going to PCR up the nematodes. This is where we went and isolated total RNA and just reverse transcribed it and said what's there. So we had an unbiased way of looking at the total community. And what it showed us was a massive um, kingdom level change. 
and you only detect that with a global analysis. That community could be broken down, and particularly in, this is the eukaryotic community, in P, we had a huge increase in the fungal community, and we continuously see that, that P are really selecting fungi uh, much more strongly than, than the other organisms. And I just want to very quickly talk about an experiment um, which was a collaboration with Christabel Wawi and NIAB. Um, and what NIAB had done a beautiful thing was to uh, generate some synthetic um, hexaploids where they crossed Egilips talshoi with, um, uh, with durum wheat to regenerate synthetic hexaploids. So recapitulating this sort of 10,000 years of selection which had occurred in the generation of hexaploid wheat. And we thought it would be really great to actually take some of the egilips, take some of the durum, the synthetic hexaploids, and say if we now grow them in a soil, what happens to the microbial community? Are they different from each other? Um, and so this is just showing the NIAB crosses. Um, they took egilips, they crossed it with durum. In fact, this was done in our experiments, we done with three separate lines of Egilips Taoshoi. Uh, they did the cross. They also did the back cross, taking the synthetic hexaploid and, and crossing it back to a modern um, hexaploid wheat. I think it was Paragon, which is actually uh, was used quite recently as a, a commercial line. And just looked at those communities. And really all I want to see is to point out here is don't worry about it. There's an awful lot of stuff down here. Um, but the key thing really, if I can get, the, if I'm, get my color blind this okay here, um, was this is the population of durum, this is the microbial community in the durum wheat. Um, this is in the red um, circle is what we see in Taoshoi, and this is the synthetic hexaploid, this pale green here. And you can see that actually the microbial community from one of the parents is durum, the other is um, uh, Taoshoi in red, it's been, the microbial community is now looking like Taoshoi. Um, and in essence, Obviously, in the case of Tauscher, we're introducing the D genome into this. And one of the things we also see in particular, although it's only a small change, it's always statistically significant decrease in the glomeromycetes. So if you like, the, um, the mycorrhizal fungi are always decreasing uh, when we have um, the, the, the crosses. And actually, when we do a back cross, um, we actually go back up to a higher level again. So. This is really early data, but it was really interesting, the principle that you can start looking at genetic crosses to try and see uh, what's happening to the community. And in essence, it does seem to be, uh, the picture so far is that the D genome that we're getting out of Taoshoi is particularly important in changing the fungal community. And here's just a bunch of uh, different fungal groups which are actually being changed, which have statistically significant um, differences uh, between the various um, um, synthetic um, hexaploids compared to the parents, or similar to the, I should say, similar to the uh, Taoshoi genome, um, which is pulling the frequency of these organisms across. So there's something in there which is important in terms of controlling the fungal community. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I think I've waffled on long enough. I put these pictures up very deliberately because here's the people that did all the real work. Um, I'm sure you're all aware I never go near a pipetta or the lab because I don't know how to do it anymore. And the three main people just happen to be sitting together at this high table dinner. Uh, here's uh, Vinoy Ramachandran who did all the initial microarray work. Uh, he's a great bioinformaticist, uh, so he now does all the in-seq analysis. Uh, this is Rachel who's actually the PhD student doing the in-seq analysis in the rhizosphere. This is Francesco uh, Pini who's doing did all the Lux analysis. Uh, over here, the man with the crazy eyes, it's just because the way the pictures turned out, yeah, is Josh, who's doing the fungal analysis. And down here is Andre Tkach, um, who's the guy who does all the microbiome analysis. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>